morning, everybody. My name is David Gutierrez, and I'm a political officer at the U.S. Embassy in Canberra. I'd like to welcome everyone for tuning in and uh, to today's event with Professor Gay McDougall, independent candidate to the UN Com uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Today's event will be moderated by Huda Kretzer, Executive Director of the Human Rights Law Center. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. As attendees, your video and microphones will automatically be turned off. This helps keep sound quality clear and reduce interference. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please note that the uh, chat function will not be monitored for questions, so feel free to use it uh, for discussion. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so if you don't want to be named in the recording, uh, we welcome you to submit your questions anonymously. Lastly, while this program is supported by the U.S. Embassy, the views of the speakers are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. government. So with that in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's moderator, Hugh de Kretzer. Uh, Hugh was a board member of the Human Rights Law Center and, when it was established in 2006 and joined the staff team in 2013 as the executive director. Under his leadership, the center has grown significantly and continues to extend its positive impact on human rights in Australia. Uh, Hugh began working to protect and promote human rights as the manager of the Brim Bank Mountain Community Legal Law Center and the Executive Officer of the Victorian Federation of Community Legal Centers. He currently serves as the Director of the Victorian Sentencing Advisory Council, as well as a member of the Advisory Board of the University of Melbourne Law School. He has previously served as a Commissioner of the Victorian Law Reform Commission and is a board member of the National Association of Community Legal Centers. So Hugh, thank you for joining us, and I will turn it over to you to introduce our guest, uh, Professor Gay McDougall. Thank you. Thanks so much and, and hello everyone and welcome to this uh, seminar. It's an absolute honour and thrill to be speaking today with uh, Gay McDougall, um, who is an eminent expert on human rights and uh, the fight against racism uh, globally. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'm meeting on the traditional lands of the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation um, here in uh, Nam or Melbourne. And uh, for those who've been following Australian media, uh, you'll know that uh, we're in a lockdown here in Melbourne. So if there are any interruptions from the kids who are, uh, uh, have their school canceled today, uh, um, uh, bear with us. The uh, um, obviously issues of racism and the rights of indigenous people have particular significance here in Australia, given the uh, history of colonization in this country. And uh, it's why it's particularly relevant to our work at the Human Rights Law Centre and why I'm particularly excited to uh, have this conversation today with uh, Professor McDougall. Uh, Gay McDougall has spent her career working on issues of race, gender and economic justice in the United States and in the global context and in South Africa in particular. Uh, she's held a number of uh, significant positions within the UN for over many, many decades, um, including UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, a member and vice chair of the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. She was also Special Rapporteur on the issue of systemic rape, rape and sexual slavery practices in armed conflict. She worked in South Africa for around 15 years to help secure the release of thousands of political prisoners from jail and to administer its first democratic non-racial elections in 1994, which saw President Nelson Mandela elected. In 2015, <coughs> excuse me, the government of South Africa bestowed on her the National Medal of Honor uh, for her extraordinary contributions to ending apartheid. After her work in South Africa, she spent 14 years as Executive Director of Global Rights, which worked with emerging human rights groups in 10 countries to help them achieve their visions of justice and uh, help to shape uh, the establishment of the Human Rights Law Centre here in Australia. Uh, uh, Professor McDougall received a JD from Yale Law School and an LNM, LLM from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, she has honorary Doctor of Law degrees from nine universities around the globe. Uh, she's currently a distinguished scholar in residence with the Leitner Centre on International Law and Justice and a senior fellow in the Centre on Race, Law and Justice at the Fordham Law School. And she joins us uh, from New York where it's uh, Thursday night. And so we um, extend our gratitude for Professor McDougall and uh, to talk today about uh, racism and, uh, and obviously in the context of 
her being an independent candidate for uh, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So Professor McDougall is going to start with some introductory remarks. Uh, we'll then have a brief dialogue with me and then there'll be opportunity for Q&A from the audience. So please submit your Q &A, your questions through the Q&A chat and I'll moderate them uh, after Professor McDougall's remarks. Thank you, over to you, Gay. Well, thank you, uh, Hugh. Um, and I wanna start by uh, thanking the US Embassy in Canberra for uh, convening this event to allow me to interact uh, with uh, thought leaders in Australia about the issues of racial justice that we are all confronted with now. And for me to talk about my priorities um, as I uh, attempt uh, to uh, go for a third term uh, on the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. You know, I'm also uh, uh, thankful. I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, President Biden um, has nominated me uh, to return to the UN. Um, and I'm also, um, you know, encouraged by the fact that he is making racial equality uh, a priority of his foreign policy, um, as well as, as domestic policy. Um, and uh, I think that is uh, extremely uh, encouraging. Uh, my life and, and my entire career have been about fighting uh, racism. Uh, I was born in the South of the US at a time when uh, we all lived under what we call Jim Crow laws, but it was uh, the US special brand of apartheid. Um, I was involved in the civil rights uh, movement. I uh, integrated a previously all white uh, college. And I eventually went to law school to become a human rights, uh, civil rights attorney. Uh, shortly after graduation, you know, I, I was working at, uh, as uh, what I was called a general counsel, but, uh, you know, it's, since it was just three of us, we did everything uh, at the National Conference of Black Lawyers. So one of the things that I uh, chose to do was to represent um, NCBL at the um, United Nations. So we had a, a, a status, NGO status at the UN, and I went there and um, my approach was to uh, give solidarity uh, to the uh, struggle uh, against apartheid um, in South Africa, but also to uh, uh, sort of uh, equate a focus on political prisoners there with uh, political prisoners uh, in the US. In any uh, event, um, that led me to a 20 year uh, immersive engagement in the global fight against apartheid. Um, and uh, during most of that period, uh, although I was in and out of the UN constantly, um, you know, most of the time I was an NGO uh, leader, uh, but nevertheless, from that engagement, um, as well as uh, the uh, work that I did to monitor the implementation of Security Council Resolution 435, which led to independence in Namibia. Well, I became deeply impressed with the pivotal role the UN played in ending such a monumental uh, you know, system of racial oppression. Um, apartheid and colonialism, if you will, in uh, Namibia. Uh, no, it didn't act alone and it didn't happen swiftly. Uh, but nevertheless, I walked away from that 20 year engagement uh, with um, uh, a feeling that um, I wanted to be a part of uh, the next uh, Phase. I wanted to be uh, an actor 
in moving the UN to the next big objective in ending uh, racism. And so for me, at least in my view, that next high point uh, was the Third World Conference Against Racism um, in Durban, uh, where uh, states declared that racial discrimination uh, existed in every country. It was in every backyard. Um, and for the first time, there was special attention placed on the illegality under international law of the transatlantic slave trade and practices of, of chattel slavery. Um, also, there were new mechanisms uh, that were established, uh, like the working group on people of African descent. Now, 20 years after the Durban conference, we have all been thrust into another singular moment in history that demands of each and every one of us, uh, individuals, nations, and institutions, that we make real the principles of equality that are firmly embedded in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. This week was the sad one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. Um, his murder, that awful uh, 10 minute video and the multitudes who flowed out into the streets around the world in grief and protest have challenged us all to finally bring this thing to an end, to end the structures of racism that have plagued so many around the world. More than anything else, this has led me to answer the call to return to the UN again. We all, I think, recognize the urgency of this moment. This has been called a time of reckoning. We face multiple pandemics, structural racism, towering inequality uh, within and between countries, extreme poverty, health systems that are too fragile and inadequate to contain a viral spread, and racist hate speech fueling anti-Semitism, physical attacks on Asians, and anti-LGBT sentiments. Um, over the past year, I have worked with the Floyd uh, family and civil society actors around the world to place uh, the issue of injustice of his murder before the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, that's what the family requested. Uh, they wanted the travesty of his death to be taken to an, the UN to receive justice. So on the basis of that appeal, I um, helped uh, draft a, a letter to the uh, uh, UN Human Rights uh, Commission um, asking uh, that they do something that was uh, very unusual. And that was to um, hold a special session on the matter and to and for it to end in a resolution establishing a commission of inquiry uh, to consider the ongoing human rights abuses, the racialized policing uh, that had its origins in the era of chattel slavery 
in the United States um, and other countries actually came to the US from Barbados. Um, th this was not a request solely about the US, although you cannot, um, uh, you cannot overlook the powerful um, you know, impetus that this thing gained from um, uh, George Floyd's murder. But at the same time, we're seeing uh, murders uh, of uh, black uh, uh, young men on the streets of Brazil in astounding numbers uh, in Paris, in the UK, in uh, a whole number of countries that uh, had their uh, had had a sort of impetus from um, the uh, legacy of slavery, uh, colonialism, um, and the conquest of native peoples. Uh, we put this matter before uh, the uh, UN Human Rights Council. Um, instead of a commission of inquiry, they insisted uh, that uh, the first step would be for the high commissioner uh, to, um, uh, to uh, draft an exhaustive, if you will, report uh, to be presented to uh, the council actually next month. So her report was to take a year, which it has taken. Um, and over that period, while some of us have had input, um, uh, making suggestions about things we think absolutely must uh, be there, uh, we are unclear and you know, haven't been informed about uh, what the uh, bottom line recommendations uh, will be. Uh, but while we wait, um, I uh, uh, do want to uh, go back to uh, sort of tell you a bit about what I hope my um, uh, priorities will be if I get uh, reelected uh, to the UN uh, Committee uh, on uh, the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, first, I, I, I want to do more to encourage states to confront the legacies of enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, and the conquest of indigenous peoples. Um, and to acknowledge the linkages uh, between uh, those acts um, and current manifestations of systemic racism. Secondly, uh, to attack the structures of racial oppression that perpetuate systemic racial subordination. Third, uh, to uh, end impunity for human rights violations by law enforcement against people of African descent and those who are attacked in anti-racism protests, um, ensuring accountability and redress for their families. Uh, helping societies also to reimagine, if you will, safety. That is, how do you guarantee uh, the right to personal security without militaristic police that all too often scapegoat vulnerable racial minorities. Fourth, I hope to be a catalyst for uh, the committee to play a larger role in uh, this second half of the decade on people of African descent. Uh, particularly with respect to the drafting of a declaration on the rights of people of African descent um, and on uh, the formation and the, 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 the mandate, et cetera, uh, for the permanent forum on people of African descent. Fifth, 
want to be a catalyst for CERD to engage more robustly around the intersection of race and poverty uh, with the hope that we can find synergies with the work of the other treaty body, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, um, with the also the implementation of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and also the International Labor Organization's work. Six, um, I think the pandemic experience really calls for CERD to uh, develop and adopt a general recommendation on racial discrimination and the right to health care equality. I mean, that has been shown to be a tremendous uh, problematic, both within and between uh, countries. And finally, um, confronting hate speech. Um, you know, the, the surge has always uh, had that as a number one on uh, the committee's list of priorities. Uh, but I think now we've got to evaluate uh, how to be far more effective. Um, the increase in hate speech, especially coming from the highest elected officers in countries around the world, has uh, really emboldened racial supremacy groups uh, with uh, dangerous consequences. And we got to find a way to not just uh, uh, talk against hate speech, but uh, to find ways to really move and, and, and stop it. Uh, so in closing, let me just, uh, you know, uh, back to the person. W.B. Du Bois, um, who was an influential uh, African-American leader of the early uh, part of the 20th century, uh, was an active participant in the conferences leading to the formation of the United Nations in the 1940s, because he believed that the UN Charter could be a source of expanded rights for Black Americans, and that the UN could create new forums in which Black Americans could assert their rights. Um, he believed that ending racism would require the cooperation of all nations of the world. And that, that belief by Du Bois uh, fueled and shaped 50 years of my career so far. So, uh, thank you, and I, I'm I'm open to uh, trying to respond to uh, questions. Thanks so much, Gay. Um, it's uh, uh, your your end point there was uh, well, an inspiration to me. Uh, who is as many decades ahead in terms of my career and uh, as a human rights advocate, but also an important recognition of the interconnectedness of these issues that we might be experiencing here in a local level or a national level in Australia with uh, similar issues that are happening all around the world and the, the power of the human rights framework to address that. And, and it's something obviously I firmly believe in and, and, and will explore through this conversation. Um, I might, uh, so, so just a reminder, we, we've got the Q&A open. Um, Professor McDougall's uh, will hopefully be a, uh, a, a, a member of the committee. So um, some of the country specific questions may be a bit hard for her to answer in the sense that she doesn't want to prejudge uh, things that may come across uh, her work uh, if she's elected to the committee for a third term. Uh, so to the extent that the questions can be put in, in broad, broader terms, that's, uh, that, that's easier for her, but I'll, 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 I'll 
I'll put those questions uh, to her and we've received some questions in advance as well, which I'll attempt to cover. Uh, so we've got about 35 minutes, but just before we go to some questions from the audience, uh, uh, issues of uh, systemic racism in policing and police brutality, uh, um, very sadly, very familiar to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities here in Australia. Uh, we had a uh, Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody in 1991. And very sadly, um, uh, we have had close to 500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people die in police and prison custody uh, since then. Uh, uh, we, we, we don't know what that report from the UN High Commissioner is gonna say in when, when it's uh, delivered uh, very shortly. What, but uh, I'm interested, what are some of the things, some of the key strategies that you would, would, would think would be um, important or, or addressed in that report in terms of how do we, how do we stop this? How do we end the impunity? How do we, uh, deliver change and accountability, and that's obviously a huge question when you're looking at a global context. But maybe drawing on the on the US and your experience in working with the Floyd family, what what are some of the changes they're hoping to see? Well, I mean, they they are hoping to uh, see justice. Now, so, uh, people have asked me, well, you know, they got a twenty seven million dollar settlement from their civil action against the city uh, and uh, uh, now um, uh, Derek Chauvin the policeman involved uh, has been uh, convicted we don't know what his sentence is but it, it was a highly uh, groundbreaking trial uh, in a lot of ways um, but um, and so I think that we could say that there has been accountability in that case. But I think justice is something much, uh, much bigger than accountability. Um, it's uh, about uh, something that is transcendent, that, um, that is actually transformative of society um, that speaks to uh, the, um, uh, the pain of not just the Floyd family, but of uh, many, uh, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, and that actually comes forth with um, uh, promises of uh, and systems of non-repetition. Uh, I think that's uh, what we have to talk about when we talk about justice. It's got to be something that is profound, irreversible, uh, transformational, uh, and not just uh, nothing. You know, a lot of people said to me, and I thought as well, because truly, the, the trial of Derek Chauvin was uh, unusual. Uh, look, we, we have about a thousand, something like a thousand police shootings every year in the US and a greatly disproportionate uh, uh, number of the victims are uh, African-American, are um, indigenous, um, Hispanic, other uh, people of color. Uh, let's just say the broad category of uh, people of color. Uh, but over the years uh, since, and I think this, this is correct, that uh, since 2013, uh, the, um, uh, there have been fewer, well, let me say, in 98% of those cases, no one was ever brought to trial. Uh, the, uh, and of course, those who were uh, tried, which were very, very few, uh, the sentences uh, were uh, brief to say the least. Uh, so this is an outrageous situation. 
uh, is not just about uh, Floyd, although his situation, what happened to him was, I think, such a statement of where we are in terms of racial uh, discrimination, in terms of racism, and, and not only that, of what is done to not just, I, in the, the, the course I teach, I taught a course on this, this uh, semester. And when I finished showing the video, um, I stopped the video and I said to the class, look, we got to talk about not just George Floyd, but what has happened to the policeman who has his neck, his knee on his neck? What has led him to uh, such a sense of inhumanity? What is it in this country, in this world, that has created a Derek Chauvin? We, we, we're in terrible trouble in this. And it starts, in my view, uh, with the decision uh, that was taken, you know, four or five centuries ago. Uh, by um, avarice Europeans who decided that if they consider uh, people in the new world, if you will, to not be human, then they wouldn't have to feel bad about uh, what they were about to do in terms of uh, the um, rape and pillage of uh, indigenous peoples and, uh, you know, the colonial settler policies and the transatlantic slave trade. And all of that lives with us now. I, yeah, I, I'm reminded of uh, some research uh, podcast I, I listened to about research that uh, a former Canadian politician, Michael Ignatieff, did I know him. yeah so he went around the world and he spoke to people in all sorts of situations uh to try and draw some conclusions about how successful or not the human rights modern human rights movement since the universal declaration of human rights in 1948 has been and 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 i might this is my interpretation of his findings was that briefly that the, the, the movement has been spectacularly successful in saying everyone in the world has value and that people in the most desperate, difficult, impoverished, disadvantaged, in prison situations felt that their life had worth and they had rights. And that is a radical transformation from the kind of ideologies that you just talked about of, of inhumanity and, and people's life being worth worth less than others and inhuman, etc. That then infected the world. But where he said that the human rights movement has a lot of work to do is that his observation was people always defined their rights in um, opposition to others. So, so it was always, always was in these groupings of rights that, that still played into this us and them kind of frame and that has been exploited so uh, mercilessly or well in a bad way by nationalist politicians in the US and around the, the globe. So I was just wondering if you, did you have any re reaction to those kinds of observations that he made in, in, in through your work and how can we counter that? How can we get people to see that when we protect the rights of everyone, it, 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 our societies are stronger and healthier and better and, and life is better for everyone. Now, I think our problem there is not um, uh, convincing people that. It's because what, what we're dealing with is a counter narrative that is being fueled uh, by um, you know, politicians, um, you know, bankers, uh, et cetera. Um, and as long as there is an audience um, uh, for that uh, kind of sentiment, uh, those 
um, at the top uh, are able to rip us all off. Um, I, I think, you see, I have, a, uh, I don't think that everybody believes that it's a zero sum game. Um, I think that they are fed that idea. Um, and uh, that's, so that's what we have to counter. It's not everybody thinks that. It's that, you know, there are some who are profiting off pushing uh, that view. You know, the other thing that I, I, I just have to say is that, you know, belief in human rights and even the UN is <laughs> really high around the world. Um, that's why I put the, uh, the, about the Floyd family. I mean, they said immediately, they said, we got to take this to the UN. And you say, well, what made them think that? Uh, but every country that walks through the conference door um, uh, for uh, our sessions at the uh, committee uh, on racism, you know, it's like a new opportunity walks in. And most of those people are, uh, you know, they, they, they believe, especially the civil society actors, um, they believe not only in human rights, the problem is, can we enforce their human rights? That, that, that's our problem. <laughs> But you know, belief in human rights is high, and I think that uh, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, those who are involved in the mobilizations on the street. And and uh, and and time and time again in Australia, the research shows there is a very high support for multiculturalism in Australia. There are. Um, uh, continued and evolving problems with racism and communities who uh, know racism too well, but um, it's heartening to see time and time again, this very, very strong support for multiculturalism in Australia, 80, 80 or so percent support through the Scanlon Foundation's research. But, but I might throw to some of the questions from the audience and uh, we've, got quite a few, so please um, uh, bear with me as I try to go through them. Um, the first one I was gonna go, go to is through, from Samin Yasmin from Crawley in Western Australia. Um, and, and it's a big question, what strategies can be adopted by developed and developing states to combat racism? I might reframe it to say, you, you've been in this incredibly privileged position through your terms uh, on the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination to see what countries are doing and what civil society is uh, talking about as effective strategies to combat racism. Could you highlight one or two examples that Australians or people on this call from our region who could look to as successful strategies to combat racism? Well, you know, frankly, uh, my first piece of advice to everyone is sit down and talk to the people who are most affected uh, by uh, racism. And, you know, I, I, if you can't find any, that's your first problem because <laughs> they're there. But you got to, you have to hear from uh, those uh, most affected and how they frame uh, their problems and what they believe are the solutions. Um, I think at the, you know, the, at CERD, we have a long list of, of you know, recommendations uh, to um, states. Uh, some of them are, you know, uh, uh, right out of the black letter of the uh, convention. Some are you know, uh, more about the learnings uh, that we have about uh, acknowledging history. Um, you know, when I was the special rapporteur on minorities and I travel around to 
something like 17, 18 countries uh, all over the world um, uh, hearing, um, you know, uh, issues in every country. Everybody starts with history, uh, you know, and that, that is, I think, an important point to start. Um, how, in your view, did we get in this situation? I mean, first of all, you got to acknowledge that there's a situation. <laughs> and then how, you know, uh, let's go back and see how we got there. And um, I think, first of all, the process of talking about and hearing uh, the other side of that historical, um, you know, uh, recollection, if you will, um, is a critical one. And um, it uh, is one that begins the process of um, healing and understanding. Um, now we got long list of things, you know, you gotta have a law, you gotta have, it's gotta have this and this and this and this in it. Uh, all that is uh, useful. Um, but uh, laws don't matter if, you know, nobody's willing to abide by them. Um, and uh, you only have a framework of a law but you have to know the context so that you can fill it out with all those uh, bits that matter most in the locality. Um, and I think that it's important to realize, you know, equality is the main thing here. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Treaty on racism is very, in one way, it's very simple. It says, look, if there are differences along racial lines, uh, you got to fix that. You know, that's it. Uh, if there are, no, you know, uh, and so it is very cut and dry. It is not about uh, whose fault it was. It's just that no society is going to get very far down the line uh, with uh, significant uh, inequalities that run along racial lines. The, the next question I'm going to go to is from my friend uh, Bill Kelly, um, who has dedicated his career to uh, using art to promote human rights and peace and justice. And he asks, can art play a role in calling attention to human rights uh, issues? And uh, Gay and I talked uh, just before the panel about, um, you know, the, the local context. You grew up in the South, littered with monuments to Confederate uh, leaders who were um, fighting to uphold their right to enslave people. Uh, maybe if you could comment specifically about the role of art in in in, in responding to those the, the memorialization of slavery and and the recognition of slavery through those uh, Confederate monuments. Well, you know, a lot of those monuments during this past year have been removed um, and replaced with uh, monuments uh, that uh, represent the people's history. Um, and, um, and, you know, speak about, you know, the, 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 the notion that we are all uh, here um, and valued and playing a role in history that will be memorialized. Um, art has been a very important part of, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the fight against racial justice all my life, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and even far before, before that, I mean, I think about the spirituals of, um, you know, slaves, uh, of course, they were codes for 
uh, when do you run and which direction do you run in, et cetera. Uh, but uh, uh, they were art. Uh, during the civil rights movement, um, the singing was something that was extraordinarily important, the music, the songs, um, and, you know, it, uh, it, it gave you a sense of solidarity uh, and uh, not exactly fearlessness, but rather that you were not going to walk out there alone. Um, in South Africa, during the days that I was there, uh, uh, during the uh, fight against apartheid, every, you know, community meeting, you had to sing. And these were songs that revved you up and got you ready for and spoke of the heroes of the struggle. And uh, all of that is very important. Um, and so it brings in also a part of the community that may not feel that it has a role in there otherwise. Um, the Artists Against Apartheid who uh, organized in the US. Um, it's a, it's a, and now, you know, uh, there are many sort of retrospectives of, uh, at, at major galleries that wouldn't have ever touched the, um, you know, the uh, art of <coughs> a black artists during the 60s and now having their retrospectives at uh, the galleries. Um, and there's plenty of it, uh, uh, stuff that we didn't even think about as art. It was the look of the movement. Uh, so yes, it's important, terribly important. I'm going to go to a question from Adam, who's a Uyghur Australian, and he, he's uh, raising issues around the, um, you know, what Mike, former US Secretary of State Mike, Mike Pompeo, Pompeo described as the ongoing genocide against Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Um, the, the question is, why, why is the United Nations not declared a joint statement to stop this ongoing genocide? And, and I know that when you were on the committee, I think last year, you asked questions of China around this issue. Uh, to the extent you're comfortable in speaking about the specific issue or, or perhaps drawing on that question to talk about some of the limitations and how we can address them in the UN system. Well, yes, that was... Um maybe uh, 2018 when China came before, or 20, yes, 20, when China came before um, uh, our committee. And I was a part of the uh, lead, you know, uh, uh, group, there were three of us who were to lead the questioning of uh, the delegation. And uh, my questions focused on uh, the uh, persecution of the Uyghurs, um, which was, um, it was interesting that uh, on the global level, at that point, not much had been heard of it. And it caused an uproar uh, the, uh, among the uh, delegation, it definitely caused an uproar. Uh, but it also pushed into action a lot of the news media who started to dig deeper, et cetera. Now, you know, I think that uh, at that time, our uh, concluding observations on China were pretty strong on that point. Um, since then, uh, so much more has uh, been uh, revealed you know, researched and revealed of the facts of what's uh, actually going on in Xinjiang. And, um, uh, and yes, it led Pompeo to say that it was uh, genocide. Now, um, you know, the way uh, the UN operates is that um, the, um, uh, the real sort of heavy lift you can only get from the Security Council. And there, uh, there are uh, a few countries that can block uh, any action uh, by a veto. 
uh, and China is one. So uh, you're only going to get so much uh, in terms of you're not going to get, uh, you know, uh, troops and out. You're not going to get um, as um, unlikely, let's say, uh, to get uh, serious embargoes. Um, you know, that's one of the uh, very disappointing things about the way uh, the UN is constituted. Uh, it never made sense. Uh, it probably makes uh, less sense now that so much power uh, to block actions uh, it's in the hands of uh, a very few countries. Um, and uh, that's our problem. And for the next question, there's a question from Trevor and Gilmore about um, effective steps to address hate speech and, and also uh, another question about um, you, you talked about anti-Semitism and targeting Asians and LGBTIQ rights, um, but uh, also looking at Islamophobia or Christianophobia. Um, uh, you know, coming from a US background, I'm interested in your views around, you know, the home, so-called home of free speech, about where you draw the line between free speech and speech that, that harms. And uh, it's a debate that's, you know, uh, uh, was, uh, almost toxic here in Australia around five to eight years ago when we we're talking about trying to wind back hate speech protections in Australia. Thankfully, we've moved on from that and there's proposals in my home state of Victoria to strengthen hate speech protections. Um, can you talk about um, effective protections against hate speech uh, through your role on the committee or, or otherwise? Well, you know, we have, I think, a very well nuanced general recommendation on hate speech uh, that, uh, first of all, um, is uh, very uh, careful in its um, definition um, and, um, and, and, and the ways in which uh, you can calibrate, uh, if you will, uh, uh, significant reactions uh, to uh, hate speech, you know, in matters where uh, it was enunciated, it matters uh, who said it, and what power that person might have in the general uh, society, and on and on and on. Um, I think, you know, um, in the U.S., I, uh, um, I think that there is some misunderstanding uh, about um, the First Amendment. Nothing is absolute. Um, and uh, so, uh, and the First Amendment is not absolute. There are restrictions on uh, speech uh, that is harmful. Um, I, um, and you know, I mean, look, you know, as a, um, um, a advocate of uh, civil rights, I've benefited from uh, generous um, uh, interpretations of the right to freedom of speech, but I've also uh, been harmed uh, by um, reluctance uh, to um, sort of uh, pull in uh, on um, hate speech. I mean, I grew up in a place where uh, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, we would see them marching to uh, Stone Mountain and, you know, lighting up the, uh, firing up the cross on Stone Mountain. And um, there was some clear speech there uh, that was extremely harmful to the rights of uh, my community um, and uh, was uh, very harmful to, uh, in fact, democratic process. So I think that uh, let's, not, let's not be silly here. 
um, hate speech, which generates things like attacks on, you know, Asian people on the street, uh, that can't be protected by, you know, anybody's notion of uh, free speech. Uh, and especially when it is generated uh, from some false notions that come out of um, the highest office in the land. I'm conscious of time and uh, we've got a number of questions that we haven't got to and we've probably only got time for one last question, but I'm just going to flag some of the other issues that have come up or that they've around the difference between uh, cultural safety for people of colour versus safety for the broader public. Uh, there's questions and you touched on this about the, the truth telling and the understanding of the uh, historic uh, context of racism and the fact that that historic context has multi-generational impacts and the need to have a reckoning or accountability with that, which is a, a live issue here in Australia, particularly in Victoria, where we're, you know, looking at the South African experience of truth and reconciliation and there is a new commission uh, to uh, look at truth and justice and the development of a treaty here in Victoria. And we hope that that will be expanded across the country. Uh, there's questions about uh, Israel and Palestine and uh, the, the, the crime of apartheid. And of course, Human Rights Watch has uh, put out a uh, important report around uh, the crimes of apartheid in Israel. Uh, questions about West Papua. So I apologize that we haven't been able to get to them. I'm going to go to uh, a last question uh, from uh, Tim Dolstra, which uh, which is, and, and it was basically reframing a question I was going to end on anyway. Um, Tim asks, what are your thoughts on the state of race relations today compared to previous moments in history? My question was going to be, are you hopeful? Um, and, and so I might Offer, offer those two questions as as a end to uh, someone who spent 50 years fighting about these issues, uh, an incredible career, an inspirational career for someone like me. Um, you know, are you hopeful uh, from from what you're seeing? Well, look, first of all, uh, things have changed. Um, you know, I wouldn't be where I am if things had not changed. When I was uh, a child, as I say, a little colored girl in Georgia, there was no hope uh, for, uh, you know, going to schools like Yale Law School, et cetera. This is out of the question. So th some things have changed. Um, but, you know, it's, it's been like a pressure cooker, you know, letting off just enough steam uh, that would allow uh, the system to go forward. Uh, yes, I am hopeful. I mean, this year particularly has been a year of tremendous breakthroughs in a lot of ways. I hate the fact that uh, George Floyd had to lose his life in order for these breakthroughs to happen. But uh, I'm not... Uh, so hopeful that I think that we are uh, near the end of this, uh, you know, endeavor. Uh, we still have a long way to go. And and that's a good good place to end. It's a it's a note of recognizing the progress that has been made, progress that has. Um, been driven by the advocacy by the communities and and people uh, and nations have been have felt the impact of racism and the progress has been vital but we still have a long way to go um, it's been a, a a fantastic discussion an honor to talk with you today thanks to the embassy for hosting this discussion. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated and for your questions. I understand this has been recorded and will be put on the embassy's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so thanks to everyone and um, all the best to you for your important work in the future. Thank you and thank you, Hugh. <laughs> thanks all. Goodbye. Bye-bye.